In today's video, we've got a big furniture project. We're going to be building this kitchen island with the majority of it being reclaimed wood. It's going to have turned legs, mortise and tenon joinery, and a hard pine top. Let's get started. This kitchen island is going to be 36 inches tall, which is the height of the customer's countertops. I start out by measuring and cutting uh, four rough sawn pieces of pine that I got from an old uh, sawmill for free. Next up, I need to get my lathe all ready, so first I had to do a quick cleanup and mount my duplicator's base. I'm going to use the duplicator just to turn the top parts of the legs. Uh, this is mainly for my farm tables, which have 29 inch legs and 1 inch tops, so with the 33 and a half inch legs that will be on this kitchen island, I'm only going to use it to turn the top parts and then turn the lower parts of the legs by hand. If you'd like to see a video on using this duplicator, it is my most watched video on my channel. I think the video's name, I'm blanking a little bit, but um, homemade duplicator using an angle grinder. That's the name. So that's all I'm going to be using the duplicator for on each of the legs. Next up, I go ahead and mark out the layout for where the tenons will um, fall on the lower parts of the legs and then start roughing out the lower part. I've actually already turned a prototype and I used that to aid in the layout. Here I'm using a parting tool just to define the edge of that lower blocky part that will accept the uh, tenon on the little cross rail that's going to be on the bottom. So I'm just going to be using a series of uh, turning tools to achieve this shape. I'm not really, uh, I wasn't really formally trained in turning, so you know, you're going to see some stuff that's probably not completely normal. For the most part, I use a roughing gouge, a parting tool, a square scraper, and a, um, a skew chisel. I use a skew chisel, it's about a one and a half inch, one inch, or one and a half inch skew chisel, and I mainly use it as a scraper. Uh, I'll also use it in its proper skew fashion, but for the most part, I just use it as a scraper. It's a pretty versatile all-around tool. You could almost get away with only using the skew chisel. These legs are relatively simple to turn. I think it's sort of, I'd call it sort of intermediate. Uh, mainly it's just tool control. Once you have tool control, you can pretty much turn anything. Um, but these legs being sort of uh, rough in the end and distressed, I'm not even actually being that careful. Little mistakes actually turn out to be good things in the end when you're doing sort of more distressed rustic uh, furniture. Um, but like I said, just using various tools. There I am using one I didn't mention. That was the little round nose scraper. That's using the toe of the skew chisel just to do a little line to just make a little definition line. And then from using the the uh, duplicator, it, it leaves a rougher surface because it is basically just a chainsaw chain cutting it. So I cleaned that up with a skew chisel. And then I'm chamfering the corners of the lower block with a hand plane. That just need to do that because the next step is doing the uh, cutting the mortises on my mortising machine which is right here. This is a ShopFox mortiser. I bought it. I think it was about 200 some dollars. It was one of the refurbished ones. But a mortising machine is basically just a hollow chisel with a drill bit on the inside and you just force the chisel down through the piece of wood and the drill bit drills out the center. So first I did the mortises for the tops of the legs and then the lower parts in that lower block. Next I need to start cutting out the aprons so I go ahead and do so and then to cut the tenons I do them on my table saw cutting them vertically. You could also do them in a cross cut sled but I made this little simple jig that slides across the fence of my table saw. I also have a video on this you can check that out it's called cutting tenons on the table saw or something like that. Um, they are three quarter inch tenons to match the three quarter inch mortising bit. So with these being one inch boards, I'm just cutting a quarter inch off of them using a dado blade. So it's just a one pass and it's done. And then you just flip it around to cut the opposing tenon on the end of the board. And it really is pretty simple technique and produces fast accurate tenons because it's measuring from the inside of the blade out and if you are doing these flat on the table saw and a cross cut sled if there's any variance in boards the tenon thickness would vary. So that was just doing the layout of the tenons and I just use a bandsaw to cut off the excess. And then where I can't cut off that other excess because of the uh, capacity of my bandsaw I just do 
cut that off with a little Japanese style saw and then here I'm chamfering the edges of those mortises I mean of the ends of the tenons to where they just don't scrape the glue off the walls of the mortises as I put this together one thing that's always good to be in practice of doing is doing a dry fit before you actually glue up your piece so here I am doing just that. I'm actually doing it for two reasons, just to make sure everything's fitting together and also to measure the lower portion between the legs to measure for those lower rails just to see how long they need to be plus the tenons. So I cut those to length and then cut the tenons onto those boards the same fashion, but these are only an inch and a half long versus where the other ones were about two and a half inches long. These pieces are going to have an offset tenon towards the bottom and then a radius cut out. You can see there how it goes together and I use a bandsaw to cut out those pieces. This is pretty much doing the same thing as I did for the upper aprons. It's just going to have that little radius cut out and that sort of gives that lower shelf an elevated um, uh, appearance which just adds a little style to the lower part to where it's not too square and boring. And doing the same techniques, chamfering the ends of the tenons and then I also used a rasp just to take off the hard edge off that radius cut from the bandsaw. Every once in a while you got to get the work boots involved and bang something together but a tight joint's a good joint. Um, so next up I go ahead and sand the pieces and some might say why didn't you already sand them? I don't know just the way I did it and I use a piece of either an old or new just belt sander belt. They work good. You can rotate them to a fresh new part of the paper and they're really strong. You don't have to worry about it ripping up in your hands. And to do the sanding of the legs, I do it right on the lathe. It's fast. It's just like a little stand holds it for you. You can rotate it around. Use the hand plane when needed. Um, I use tight bond too for the most part on everything I do with a little cup and chip brushes. I get the chip brushes and from Harbor Freight, the cups from the grocery store, and the glue from Lowe's or Home Depot. And I get the gallons of glue because I go through tons of it. So this is not a mock-up gluing. This is the real thing. You can see that I'm brushing the glue in. And for the most part, this stuff is pretty straightforward and easy. I um, make sure I don't cut my tenons too tight to where I don't have too much of a problem and try not to have them too loose to where they're just flopping around. On occasion, they are cut a little too loose. And what I'll do is take something like a piece of veneer with glue on both sides and slip that into the joint along with it and that tightens things right up but uh, if you use plenty of glue it'll fill in any gaps and this uh, I'll call it new new yellow glue is really I mean it's some it's some super great stuff and for gluing this up getting it all clamped up I'm using uh, band clamp clamps and I buy these from Harbor Freight I think they're six or seven dollars per pair and then on the lower portion I'm using just some bar clamps to get everything lined up and to make sure the piece is square you can measure from corner to corner it should be equal and if it's not you just tug it into either direction until it is for the top of this table I'm starting out with two and a half inch thick heart pine floor joists they were 20 feet long two and a half inches thick and 12 inches wide and I'm using my little portable lunchbox style planer it's a delta model to do the planing and then there's the first cut just to show you the contrast between fresh and rough cut wood and uh, my little planer was giving me a little bit of a problem it's been acting up over the past year with not being able to feed the wood through it as good I've done all the different things to help it out but um, I decided that I was going to do the best thing for it and replace it I still have it and I'll use it for doing rougher work but there you can see pulling it through hands free 12 inches wide perfectly smooth cuts and, and that's what I'm after I'm not trying to take any longer or have this be any more difficult than it has to be and for $270 I got that little planer I did a video on that a full opening and review of it so you can check that out once those boards were cut to length um, I had to join the edges and I wanted to try to do this a different technique not on the joiner but do it on the table saw uh, straight ripping them so I used some roofing nails and nailed them to a piece of plywood that did have a nice straight cut on it and let one side hang over and the other side rode against the fence and uh, straight cut the edges and it worked out pretty good I did have to go back in there and hand tune it with a hand plane a little bit in some areas to help in the glue up I do some biscuit joints in between these boards that helps align the boards to where the tops don't shift out of place and um, just using pipe clamps and different bar clamps and uh, wiping up all the excess glue in the end those biscuit joints also add some extra strength to it which it probably doesn't need but it is there 
You just saw me measuring for the lower rails for the shelf and then I just split a one by six and a half and then using a square marked a layout and drilled some countersink uh, holes for screws to hold these into place. You could do mortise and tenon joints here but I'm using screws because that shelf doesn't have too much weight on it. Next I'm using some little cherry plugs that I cut using a plug cutter and then just tapping those in with a little glue. Then using a 3 8 inch brad point bit, I'm drilling holes through the legs, through the tenons, and then I peg them with these oak dowels. And I sand chamfers into either side of these dowels, that helps it slide into the hole and then has that rounded appearance on the outside, which keeps it from splitting when I'm hammering on them. To add color to this piece, uh, I do a strange thing that maybe most people might sneer at, but I just use uh, little small tubes of acrylic paints to tin up uh, whatever I need to tin up to. Instead of having one color stains or a bunch of stuff sitting around, I just have these various tubes of paint that I tint up. I do mainly water-based uh, finishes and I like the control of being able to tint it and change it as I go. And um, So as you can see, it started out light and then I built up the color as I went, which is a nice thing to be able to do. Um, for the top, it did have some termite holes or some sort of bug holes, so I filled those with some plastic wood wood filler, and while that was setting up, I measured for the shelf. I probably should have gone ahead and cut it, but I hadn't done it yet. And I'm using those same 1x6 untreated decking boards to do so. First, I just join one edge and then rip them all to equal widths to where it makes the shelf the size that I want it to be. And um, I'm using my rigid portable table saw here with the little flip top thing rigid also makes. And I did a video on both of those and you can check that out too. I've still got the full review coming up. And these are just glued up. No biscuit joints or anything like that. It's a strong enough joint. It's not under any stress. Most of the time I don't use the biscuit joints unless I need it for alignment purposes. And uh, you glue something like this up and it dries in uh, maybe two or three hours enough to go on to the next step. And while it was drying, I went ahead and smoothed up that wood filler and gave the top its initial sanding. While the biscuits do help align the faces of the boards, the ends uh, shift sometimes. So I went ahead and marked out a straight line, set up a fence out of some plywood, and then cut along the edge with a circular saw with a really nice sharp new blade on there. The blade will not cut all the way through, so I have to finish off the cut with my Japanese saw, and then using a belt sander, I go back in there and smooth that cut up, starting out with a rough grit sandpaper and working it up to uh, something like a 180, and then I can go back in and sand it later with my orbital sander. You just saw me sanding the bottom of the table just to smooth it up a little bit, and then I went around the edges, sanding the edges, and then chamfering the edges with the belt sander. And uh, once again, this is the bottom of the table. And I do apply a finish to the bottom of the table. This helps any sort of uneven moisture in the table, which causes uh, warping and cupping of your top. If you didn't do that, you'd end up with sort of a rounded top that things would roll right off of. So this is the table flipped back over. And I gave it another light sanding up to 220 with my orbital sander and then blew it off with a uh, leaf blower just to remove any dust and started applying a finish. I apply three or four coats of this sanding in between each coat once fully dry with a 220 sandpaper. So that was the lower shelf getting smoothed out with a belt sander. I use a, a heavy 80 grit sandpaper to kind of really rough it up. It looks better in the end instead of having it super smooth and tinted it the same color as the base. Next using a 3 8 inch slot cutting bit with my router I cut uh, various grooves on the insides of the apron and this is what's going to attach the tabletop. And um, I have a video on attaching tabletops if you'd like to see that video. This is a detail of those slots. They're about four inches each and you'll see in a minute how they work out. And here's the same grooves cut in the rails for the lower shelf. Well at this point we're pretty much finishing up the table doing some finishing and assembly. I use Minwax Polycrylic on most all of these types of uh, farm tables and kitchen islands. It's a water-based finish. It dries very fast, so that is a big help when I'm trying to get these projects out the door and to the customer's home. Um, next, I need to go ahead and center up that lower shelf. I do the finishing without it on. It makes it a little easier. 
And uh, so you center up the shelf, clamp it down, and then I flip it over. And I'm going to mount it using those grooves you saw earlier. You can see them right here, and there's the little table button. I cut those on a table saw. And then pretty much all they do is they slip in there. They're offset a little towards a little gap between them and the underside of the tabletop or shelf. And then when you tighten them down, they cinch in, making it a nice firm fitting. And if you'd like to see more, I have a separate video showing this exact process of mounting a tabletop. Due to the size and weight of these kitchen islands, I choose to do the final assembly in the customer's home, where I mount the top the same way as I mounted the shelf below and in the other video that I mentioned. Getting my pieces of furniture into the customer's houses is often a solo mission, so having the tops not attached to the base makes it much easier for maneuvering down hallways and through doorways. The customer was friendly enough to let me film inside of her home, showing it before and after. You saw her little original white store-bought table versus the new kitchen island. And like I said before, once it was in place and we decided on how she wanted the top centered on the base, I attached it with the same method as the shelf below. When it came to aesthetics and dimensions, this made for a perfect piece for her kitchen. Well, that brings today's project to an end. I hope it was both informative and inspirational for your future projects. And if you have any questions at all, please let me know in the comments below or by sending me a private message. If you'd like to see more videos like this, subscribe to my channel and you will get updates when I post future uploads. You can also follow me on Facebook. That link will be in the description of this video. I want to thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. If you enjoyed this video and would like to become a supporter of the Homestead Craftsman YouTube channel, there are several ways you can do so. First, if you're not already a subscriber, you can click the red button on the screen now and you will get updates when I post all future videos. You can also click the thumbs up button and leave a comment below the video. I also make posts to Facebook so you can head on over there and see different updates and photos that I post there. But the biggest way you can support the channel is just to continue watching the videos as you already are. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.